call the meeting of the Deerfield Elementary School Committee, committee to order at 7 o'clock. Uh, for the record, this meeting is being recorded. Um, well, I looked at my agenda. The first order of business, I <laughs> thank you, is uh, reviewing the minutes from last month. Very good. Thank you. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve? Move to approve the minutes of September 19th, 2024. Second. All in favor? 5 0. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have a financial statement. And welcome, Lynn. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so since the last meeting, we have processed eight warrants totaling $157,040.83. Uh, Shelly sent out expense reports earlier this week. I believe any overdrawn accounts have already been um, reviewed, but if there are any questions or uh, if something doesn't look familiar, I'm happy to take questions on that. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you, Mike. If you guys, if you're done with Mike, you probably go. Sorry, what? If you guys are done with Mike. Oh yeah, unless you really want to hang out. You know, as tempting as that is, I think I will take the exit. Thank you very much. You're good. Okay. okay. Okay, up next, please pull your All right, so um, well, our grand opening was celebration was a success. Um, you know, we were, it was wonderful to have the performances of the marching band and our Red Hawk mascot showed up. I didn't know, so thank you, whoever maybe Darius that um, thought of that. Um, and it's so nice to welcome the students in a more safe and accessible entrance. We also had our first all school meeting where many classrooms shared and um, had performances and the diversity and leadership team introduced our first whole school read aloud book, Amazing Grace, which ties into our October theme of identity. Um, now that all of our uh, district assessments and screening tools have been, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Administered, thanks. We have um, launched our first round of RTI, which is our response to intervention. Um, they help, that helps us to identify those struggling learners. And in our school, we, we have RTI for grades K through six. It focuses on math, reading, and social emotional um, development. Data is collected weekly on these and we closely monitor students to, for uh, instructional adjustments. And RTI cycles are reviewed every six weeks to evaluate each student's progress. And RTI, we really strive for the find, uh, to strengthen the foundational skills and foster academic and social emotional growth and catch students early. Um, also, we recently, today, completed our first round of data meetings for the year at Deerfield. Uh, so three times a year, teachers meet by grade level with interventionists and special educators to review um, detailed data sheets. Um, these data sheets include multiple data points like RTI, SST, attendance, um, Teachers bring in formative assessments to, this is guided by, um, our, our meetings are guided by Hattie's 10 mind frames and um, physical learning. This year, our primary focus is on math. It aligns with our new Bridges curriculum. Uh, through the Suns, we're making targeted adjustments that strengthen students' mathematical understanding. Um, I've included a data on the next page, just a data meeting agenda, so you can kind of see what the process is that we follow. And then I thought it would be important to talk about open architect versus data charts. So you might remember that our, um, so one of the key recommendations that came out of the equity audit was to have a system that we could look at data efficiently. Um, so to support this, the district has secured open architect, which is a robust management system. And you're not gonna see how robust it is, but that little picture on the left <laughs> will show you like some of the platforms on it. Um, this is really exciting because the picture on the right is uh, a, a, lo a look at our Excel sheets that we've been implementing on our own. So we take all that data and put them in an Excel sheet. So those, I cut off student names on the other side, but we manually right now put data into an Excel sheet so that you can 
see where students are and color them so we can analyze it visually. So we're excited to kind of dig in a little bit more this year. That'll be our work um, looking into the um, open architect. And just so you're aware on the other side is um, an overview of the assessments and screeners. I talk about it in the RTI, I didn't read it, but I talk about it in the RTI just to give you an idea of what those screeners and assessment tools are um, that I referred to in the report. Thank you. You're welcome. There's no questions or comments. So far, so good. All right. Next up, we have public comment um, and people who uh, signed up. I think we'll just start with that, and then if anyone else, um, we can move on to them. So we'll just go in order of the names I have. Holly, hi. My name is Holly Johnson. I live in Wavy, and I'm here representing the CPAC, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council for the district. And we're, I'm here to um, oppose the changes to the potential changes to the homeschooling policy. Um, the responsibility of the CPAC is to um, advise the school committee on matters that pertain to um, the education and safety of students with disabilities. So that's not just special education law, that's any matter, so that would include this policy that um, will affect disabled students in our community that are homeschooled or families who are considering homeschooling. There are many reasons a family decides to homeschool their disabled children. It can be hard to get our children the resources and individualized learning they need to thrive in school. Disabled children are also more likely to be bullied. There are bullying policies in place that are not always effective. In these cases, families choose to homeschool to keep their child safe. This proposed policy change could potentially force them to choose between safety and their child's desire to participate in school-sponsored activities, which are not just the sports at Frontier, but socializing in, in elementary schools, music, art programs, recess. Um, there has been some discussion that homeschool families are not part of the district community, and I respectfully disagree. Legally, the school district has to approve and provide oversight of homeschooling with a focus on whether instruction and progress equals that to that in the public schools. <coughs> In addition, when a disabled student is homeschooled, the state still requires the district to provide evaluations and IEP services to those students. They are also included in the number of eligible special education students for federal funding. IEP students come to the school for services, including socialization. Whether they are enrolled in the school or not, all students, including homeschoolers, are a part of this community and deserve the opportunity to participate in these activities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Mike Dodonna from Deerfield. Um, I'm a father of two children. One is a special needs child who we homeschool and the other attends the local school. It was suggested in the school committee meetings that homeschool children may not be held to the same academic and behavioral standards as school kids. My homeschool child gets up early. He completes academic work every day, including reading, writing, math, and science. He has never made this much academic and social progress until we began the homeschool. It was not an easy decision, but it was a necessary decision. He did so well that we have continued to homeschool. He loves to be active in the community. He went to a school activity last week where he met a local author, read and ate pizza with other kids. He plays soccer and loves to run. I could see him joining a track team in the future. He attended math night and family night. He goes to the school for playground and knows many of the kids. He is an active member of this community. There, there are potential extracurricular opportunities not even yet established in our district. Our family is working with Deerfield Elementary School to establish Best Buddies, which is a student-run club that creates one-to-one -one connection between students with and without disability. If our child was excluded, this opportunity would not be a current potential and our community would lose the opportunity to be to be enriched by it. Our other child is enrolled at the local school. We have had to reach out numerous times to alert the school about behavioral concerns of other enrolled students, some of which were very upsetting. Most of these disruptive children participate in extracurricular activities. We have discussed the prospect of homeschooling her so she may have a more productive academic life and a safer social experience. 
I don't know how I can justify to our homeschool child that he can't participate even though he once did. My child will be affected by this policy, by this policy change, but the school did not alert me, involve me, or give me the opportunity to ask questions or have discussion. The district did not give any objective reasoning. We pay our taxes, we homeschool lawfully, we receive permission and authorization from the superintendent, we meaningfully educate our child. My child is a well-behaved and now academically achieving homeschooled child. What part of our scenario warrants excluding him and limits his access to important opportunities? The Department of Education's website states, the school board is a legal agent of the state and must therefore fulfill both state and federal mandates. At the same time, the board must be responsive to the community it serves. Homeschooled students are legally recognized by the state and certified by our superintendent. They are our community's children. I urge you to oppose this policy as the board works to fulfill its responsibilities to the community it serves. When weighing this policy out, it appears that it will hurt more children than be of benefit. I urge you to consider this and oppose this policy change. Thank you. Thank you. Ashley? Hi, um, I'm Ashley. Um, I'm a mother. I'm also a nurse in the community. Um, I, I want the committee to know that a family informed me their student was told on three separate occasions this academic year that he could not participate in an extracurricular activity because he is homeschooled. This highlights a potential bias underlining this policy proposal and raises concerns to me about the ethical implications of school leaders practicing policies discretionarily. Um, as the superintendent spoke of an us versus them mentality at the frontier meeting, it became clear how our community is establishing a precedent for exclusion if we vote this in, if you vote this in. Lacking diversity of thought and consideration for others as well as for community enrichment. As a family affected by this policy, we have taken our time to review the handbook and policies and the commitments of the district. My opinions are not meant to be nef nef nefarious. I want to share my informed reasons for opposing it. First, the district's justification has been minimal, and, in, and it also lacks the con create objective rationale needed to justify a drastic measure of full exclusion of an entire group of children whose parents are within their legal protection. Second, it negatively impacts a group of community's children, yet stakeholders in this decision were not made aware or invited to engage in discussion, most notably the CPAC. While CPAC is parent-led, it's district required and set forth by the Department of Education with regulations mandating CPAC's participation in the development and evaluation of district initiatives that impact children with special needs, mine being one of them. There are current special education students who learning, whose learning needs do not, have not been fully met by the public school system, particularly those whose neurotypes do not align with a singular model. CPAC represents these children in and again, our child is one of them. Although we planned for our child to attend our town school, he faced significant challenges each year due to disability, despite the support of caring teachers and therapists. His progress was limited and bullying was a concern. Homeschooling was not our original plan and it's not easy, but it was necessary even with the special education support at school. Although my child is no longer enrolled in public school, the Massachusetts Department of Education still recognizes him as a lawful student. And our superintendent, our superintendent does certify that our home education plan is, quote unquote, from the application, is equal to the education provided to students attending Frontier Regional and Union 38 and thoroughness and efficacy. And moving forward with my points of opposition, the district did not explore less drastic alternatives or even proactive options that would better preserve our commitments and what this means for the stakeholders. I believe it's an extreme solution to a hypothetical problem. I was made aware that at the high school level, there are only two children who are currently receiving, um, who are participating in extracurriculars who are homeschoolers. Both have met the standards and are authorized. 
And considering the speculation of unmet behavioral standards, we have a handbook that outlines a response in which the district makes case by case, excluding an entire group, grossly goes outside of the district's own behavior and disciplinary procedures. We have an equity, an equity commitment signed by, by our district in which we believe, part of it is we believe in the importance of having accessibility on every level and every location to all students in our school community for equity and inclusivity. Well, Frontier's committee discussion focused nearly on high school sports, I wanna highlight the extracurricular activities encompass a wide range of opportunities and not just at the high school level. They provide social engagement, teamwork, communication, emotional intelligence, and resilience, as well as skills essential for a future community. It leveled me to hear our kids, my kid, reduced to a homeschooler who is choosing a la carte options as if it were a rec department, suggesting that he is splintering the fabric of the district. I am hurt by this bias and it doesn't describe our family and it weaponizes extracurriculars for my child and others. We are a district who is turning towards inclusion and yet this pod policy does not model this for our children. I would remind us that the Department of Education does not promote the exclusion of homeschoolers from extracurriculars and thank you for your time. I don't know if I can follow that up. She said pretty much everything that I needed to say. My name is Nancy, I'm a community member and in my home, one child is enrolled in the district school and thriving and one is special needs who is homeschooled. Both children are involved in the community and extracurricular activity. I oppose the policy change that will impact homeschooled children for many reasons. First, our homeschooled child is allowed to participate and has done nothing wrong and there is no way to justify this change to him. Second, our family followed all the required steps to have the homeschool plan approved and authorized by the district. I oppose the change because it impacts children in the community and there was no time or space created for prior discussion. I oppose this change because it goes against the district's signed commitment to equity I oppose this change because no other alternatives were explored or discussed. I oppose this change because a district educated children who can't meet the academic and behavioral, behavioral standards go through a tiered approach to disciplinary action and remedial opportunities. I oppose this change because there has not been any objective reason given. This leaves a lot of unanswered questions. Finally, I oppose this change because unjustified exclusion of a group of children feels discriminatory. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for um, speaking and being here tonight with us. I appreciate it. Okay, um, um, moving on to unfinished business, we're going to talk about policies. I think it makes sense for us to talk about the A group of policies um, and vote on those, then we can move on to the homeschool policy. Does that make sense? Anyone have any questions or comments on the, the A group that those policies are non discrimination and harassment regarding sex and gender? Right. Does that include the new policy? Uh, that's ACA, ACAA, ACAB, ACAR, ACAA, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, I just wanted to refer to ACAA page two on transitions, names and pronouns and transitions. Um, is there, it's not clear what parental rights are within uh, these two areas. I think some clarity there might be needed, specifically when we look at the last paragraph, or the last two paragraphs, um, excuse me, the last paragraph. Some transgender and gender non-conforming students are not openly so at home for reasons such as safety concerns or lack of acceptance. Uh, here is where um, 
the school's action would then step in. School personnel should speak with the student first before discussing a student's gender nonconformity or transgender status with the student's parent or guardian. Um, and then for some reasons, school personnel should discuss with the student how the school should refer to the student, uh, e.g. appropriate pronoun use or written communication to students, parents or guardians. So in that section, uh, I'm just not sure what the school's action plan is. So a student approaches the school, says, um, I'm transitioning, but it's unsafe. Uh, I don't feel safe to communicate this at home. What is the, is the, their notification still sent to homes at that point? I think that's not clear in the, the policy. It's a good question. Um, in a sense of it, the school doesn't want to be in a place between the family and the student, but it's going to support the student's decision. Um, and I think it's also, you're looking at a, a policy that's looking at you know, pre-K to 12, and it's also going to be a difference of, you know, how old the child is. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's a good a good point in the sense of, you know, we could probably get greater clarity um, within that. Tina, if we have a spot, do you have any thoughts on that, having at the elementary level? Um, typically, we work with families around and, As we see, most of the time, if, if the families are part of yeah, it. Yeah, they're part they, of the conversation. But when they're not, it's a good question. If it's a sensitive, that's a real sensitive moment right there. And I don't know if it's been, there's been an instance that here or in, in the district at large, but in preparation for such a moment, I think it's probably wise to look at um, what clearly is communicated with homes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, I mean, we know it's clear, the policy is clear about what the school will do to support the student. But at, at a certain point, you know, I think that's just how does that get sent home in, in those mm -hmm. more delicate circumstances. So I'm not sure being being new, I'm not entirely sure about how the policy then gets on, um, how we look at um, that change or right. that gets discussed. It, it makes me, I'm just thinking through what you're saying and I'm wondering if it should be a policy or if it needs to be a part of this because this is about how the school supports the student and then that home school communication um, by leaving out clarification. I, I wonder if it's okay to leave out clarification on that so that there's flexibility mm. among grades and among in terms of reading a situation around child safety mm -hmm. um, because Policies about homeschool communication about personal things is so delicate. I'm afraid that a policy might not capture everything that needs to be captured in an individual situation. And then I wouldn't want to be going against policy in one of those wild outlier situations. Um, but I think that it should be thought about and practiced in advance. Like everything you said about advanced thought makes sense to me. Everything you said about um, how important it is to not be caught by surprise in the situation but I, I just wonder if it needs to be a policy since this is about how we support students not about homeschool communication yeah would in that situation would it fall more under whatever policies or practices you have in place regarding any situation where a student is struggling or you have concerns about what's going on at home or a student has some kind of emotional thing they're dealing with it, to me it would be the same as anything like that it would be a judgment call and I think so. Probably Deciding when to tell a parent that you're concerned about their uh, lots of things. Yeah. 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 It, it said, it, this is Desi saying, when determining which, if any, staff or student should be informed of a student's gender identity is different from assigned birth, decisions should be made in consultation with the student. Or in the case of a young student, the student's parent or guardian, but it doesn't say what, what a young identifies as a young student. Mm -hmm. Um, the question is whether or not how sharing information will benefit the student. And then it gives an example, but the example is not super helpful. I think this is such uncharted territory that, I mean, in thinking and reading the policy prior to the meeting and, and trying to think of examples that might be helpful guides, it's, we don't necessarily have them. 
and so that's a challenge um, in and of itself. I, I, I guess I bring up the point because I, I, I think Darius, you said it very well, we don't want to get in this back and forth situation. We want to support the student, but we also have a responsibility to not, uh, we have to communicate to, to homes. Yeah. And so maybe the language looks something, the extent of, um, you know, the, the school, to, you know, to the best of their, you know, legal responsibilities and, and, and ability uh, will work with homes during, you know, to communicate these, uh, the, the support that the child will receive. But again, if it's a really hostile home environment, it's, it's, it's hard to say. So, um, but that's why I want to bring it up because I, I don't know necessarily what the answer is for that case scenario that we're, that we're using. In those situations, you know, I'm just thinking, <clears throat> like a principal wouldn't be making that decision on their own. They would be talking to the psychologist or like a, uh, an adjustment counselor who's very trained in all of these things in terms of like assessing for home safety and what, you know, making that call. Like, so it would be or an administrator making that decision in a vacuum. I don't know if it makes sense to clarify the role of a different school person to help make that call in conjunction with the student, but um, ultimately, is this a better policy than what was there before, I guess is a question, right? Like, is this something policy, that can be revisited? This is, really, this is a new policy, it doesn't so exist. So we don't yet. have anything now. No, so ultimately, this is still maybe better than having right. nothing at all. Potentially a work in progress. I mean, it's big. <laughs> you know, I, I just had to read you know. I didn't read this before I walked in the room again. And so, you know, so I just kind of read through it again. But basically, you know, it's talking about working with the student um, throughout the process. You know, um, schools will consult with the student before discussing the student's gender conformity or transgender status with the student's parent or guardian. So it's, it's a, it, you know, it says that on page three. So, you know, it's talking about working with the student and through that. There's no, um, there's no emergency timing on that. You know, and so I think, depending on the age of the student and the other factors that it'd be tough to put into a policy, it's not. It doesn't define it. I don't know if, it, if we need to define it. Is the is what I'm kind of saying. It's saying that we're going to work with the student and and so forth. And if the student has such a home life that they don't want to discuss it, do we, we rather than not be fearful of sharing that at school and creating a safe environment at school in fear that school will have to tell their parents. Um, if their parents, you know, the school working with them, you know, it, it's a tough call, but I, I think it's a tough call. And I stand in the kind of in the, the side where, uh, we, the communication has to take place to the parent mm -hmm. uh, and the support has to be there for the student. And so it's, uh, it's trying to thread that needle, mm -hmm. uh, so that we're doing our due diligence on both sides. And so if somehow this could say we, um, the notification to parents is essential that would be that would do that because then everything else in there would is supporting the students so you're having um, you doing your due diligence from a parental responsibility standpoint but then everything else is laid out for the student as well so if you want to you can propose an amendment to the policy which we could vote on it would make us an outlier with the other schools that I think has so far voted well and i think the right right in, in, in the other layer in this and i'm not saying you you could also not vote the policy and ask for feedback would be probably more appropriate than amending the policy mm -hmm. because this was put together by a group as you know as i talked about the last meeting a lot of hands touched this including student or student body um, reps um, from lgbtq plus um, club um, where they are looking at it from their lens as well. And for us to take it and make a significant change like that, I would want to get at least their feedback before switching it again on that kind of thing because they had a hand in the development of the policy, as well as the people from the a and &E committee that were, you know, um, put on it. And it also see what the standard is, you know. Um, I can get, like, you know, this went through legal. They didn't seem to have any problems with it, but we didn't ask that question. I just think the student disclosures uh, 
sexual orientation to a teacher, there wouldn't be any feeling like you would need to reach out and this feels the, the same policy, the same situation, unless it gets to a, a area. I mean, it's, it might be the child is not presenting as gender fluid or trans, except at school, and this is their safe space. Right. And you see that just from a, the teaching perspective is that it's not really much different than that. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe what we should do is um, look to vote on that one first, then maybe take the other ones as a group. Take, take some of them as a group, right? Vote on this. Okay. When we're ready, vote on this one, and then right. vote and on the other four. But also know that the committee has to agree with those well. So you know what I mean? In the sense of in, not to put against you, but you know what I mean? <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're looking for the change, and you guys have to agree that you want to do a change, or you want to table it as a group. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking logistically. We vote on this one, then we vote on five together. Sure, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> just to uh, We don't have to vote on each of these individually, I don't think, unless there are other discussions. I, guess, I think before that happens, I just want to say that um, the, uh, some of the guidance that the AME committee used to write this did come from the state, and the goal in, in like reading the text from the state is about how do we support students. Mm -hmm. It isn't guidance. They didn't offer guidance on homeschool communication. And so I do think that that's an incredibly important issue, but I don't know that it belongs in the document that's talking about how do we support students. I just want to be clear that not wanting to change this doesn't mean we don't want to think about homeschool communication. Yeah. This, this does do, though handle that topic when we talk about communication with parents or guardians when we um, back to the, the section on transitions. Uh, you mean the second paragraph? Uh, in both the, the from the from the bottom, the, the second from the bottom, and then the, the last paragraph. It, it does it does discuss um, how parents will be communicated with. I, um, well, right. So the school shall offer to hold a meeting with the student and the parents. If the, if the parents are involved in the process to develop a transition plan so that this child's comfortable mm -hmm. at school. And then, so that offer, that's like an offering process, not like a, not, not a notification, but to offer a support process so that nobody's alone trying to figure out how this is gonna work. And then in the second part, school personnel should speak with the student first before discussing the topic with the parents. In other words, letting the student know, I'm gonna be bringing this up with your parents is what that says so that the child isn't surprised that the parents have been informed. Um, that saying that we should let the student know that that's our line of communication before going directly to the parents without the student's knowledge. And so I, I think that that's all about supporting the student and having a comfortable mm -hmm. experience. But I don't, I don't think it says exactly like the thing that you were looking for is not in here and i just keep wondering where does that kind of clarity belong if it you know maybe in another document my thoughts are i don't think i would like the policy to lay out a specific when and why the parents are contacted i think we should leave it to the schools to maintain flexibility in the case by case basis of how the family is contacted when or if well, I, I would agree with that <clears throat> i don't i hate to tie you know or use the word like essential and really box box it in because i think there are enough professionals and psychologists and school adjustment counselors principals all of you that would as a team make a decision like that and help help in support of the student desi actually reading on um some trans, transgender and gender nonconforming students are not openly are not open so <clears throat> are not openly so at home for reasons such as safety concerns or lack of acceptance. School personnel should speak to students first before discussing to the student's gender nonconforming and transitions transgender status with the student's parents or guardian. For the same reason, school personnel should discuss with the student how the school should refer to the student, e.g., appropriate pronoun use in and written communication with the student's parent or guardian. So they leave it completely up there. He just lifted it right from Dessing. Right from <laughs> So they're saying no. They're saying it goes right. Um, we fortunately have not had that issue where we've had to work with families, but um, they're saying it's in the power of the students.
and so we can make a motion to make an amendment to the policy you can do that yes Would you like to do that? Or should I look for a motion for approving the policy? I don't want to rush you. Uh, I would like to make a motion that we table ACAA for a further review of parental communication surrounding transitions. Just because we don't have the necessarily the case studies, but it's just a lot we don't know. And that's, I know it's a hot button issue and I, and I don't mean to slow down the policy train that we have, we have some good stuff, but that's just an oversight that uh, whether it belongs here or somewhere, uh, it's, it feels essential to this process. Is there a second to the motion? There is no second. The motion uh, does not pass, and we move forward to the second original motion. Okay. Further thoughts? Okay. Then I would be looking for a motion to approve policy ACAA. A motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? Right. All in favor? Or all against? Okay. Thank you. The motion passes four to one. You probably okay. should just do more. Right. <laughs> just go for it. All righty. You ready to start typing? Yeah. All right. Uh, would anybody uh, like to motion to approve policy ACA? Move to approve. Any discussion on that one? Hearing none, all in favor? Motion carries 5 0. Move to approve policy AC, maybe. Second. There's no discussion on that one. All in favor? Motion carries 5 0. Motion to approve ACA dash R. Second. Okay. Okay. All in favor? A motion to approve AC dash R. Second. I'm on a, I'm <laughs> on a roll. roll. It's a good pattern, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it easier to rotate. Yeah. 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 All right. All in favor? Five. All right. Thank you. Okay, that I think that got us got us to one, two, three, four, five, all the A's. All right. Okay. Uh, now I'd like to move on to policy IHBG, which is the proposed changes to uh, homeschooling involvement in extracurriculars. Uh, I would just like to note that Frontier voted on this on Tuesday, and after a robust discussion, uh, they voted down the policy change. So they voted no on that. So in the interest of keeping policies across the district, and this affects Deerfield less than Frontier, so I think it makes sense to, I would supposedly also vote no for this policy. I would like to open this for discussion. Anyone have I have, oh, go ahead. I just had some, oh. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors? <laughs> oh, you don't, okay. How many, we, so I just, in, we might have this, um, how many homeschoolers do we have in the district? 25 for the whole district. No, no, it's 25 for Frontier. Okay. Deerfield has, you know, it's in my other folder. That's um, okay. But, but it, uh, Deer, Frontier is 25. Okay. Deerfield has like 16, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm going off of memory on that. Let me see if the, let me see if the digital copy is in there. Okay. That's not families, that's students. Yes. Correct. Students, not families. And for DES, what, um, how many of those students have? 
we don't have that data. We only have those who are using services. Okay. Unless there's there are many there are some families that have never stepped foot in the building because mm -hmm. we don't even know um, again if they have an education plan or that kind of thing. So it would only be those receiving services. Okay. And I don't have that number in front of me. I can get it. Okay. I would like that. I can maybe after the meeting at some point. You could let us know that if you might. Actually, or Tina can. Tina, Tina, Tina will know who will bring some assistance. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about that. One homeschool student that we are providing services okay. to. Okay. One of 16. Can you define extracurricular? Because I feel like I'm, I, I'm really here, like I am hearing like sports and like club and drama but then like things like music and band like so i'm i'm because i thought those were part of the school that's day that's so that's okay, okay. That's extra cookers events that happen outside the school hours they're sponsored okay so the that's what we're talking about when we're talking about extracurriculars outside of school hours so we're not talking about band or art or like an art class, like a specific right, art that's class. Part of your, that's part, that's of, the part of the school day. School okay, co-curricular instead of extracurricular. Co-curricular, co co thank you. So the policy says uh, not be eligible to participate in interscholastic athletic program, student government, and student activity program. Uh, what is there available at the elementary school level? Is it, what is, is there anything that is actually There's nothing currently included here? There was concern about what about the future if we bail have after school. Let's say we'll just say a we created a basketball team that was Deerfield Elementary basketball team instead of the rec program. That would be if we did that in the future, that would you know, this policy would limit those students. So for students who are non five oh four IEP, if they want to access something like gym or art or band, like a one class here and there. Kind of thing is is there a process to ask for that or is it kind of if if you have an IEP then that could be part of the IEP team they would process. have to request that through to me okay so there is so that's but that's separate than extracurriculars that's co-curricular separate from extracurricular all right what about a program like girls on the run it's not run by the school directly it's run by parent organization Raise a parent position. Like Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. so. But it's how it's done. It's, it's, it's So, yeah, things, are, things happen on campus, but it's not run by, you know, it's a lot like all the, uh, rec again, looking at the sports, but the recreation sports that are housed here, the basketball leagues, all that stuff, all the announcements go through the school system, but it's run by Deerfield Rec, and private school students are playing on it and that kind of stuff. Anyone has access to it. Anybody who lives in town. And they allow us you know, school choice um, uh, for rec if, programs. Uh, for the rec program, I think they do. Hey, if you're not a different resident, I think they pay a little more. Okay. Yes, they are allowed. If there's, there's always that oh, caveat. Yes. Yeah, wait, we don't say that on there. But. <laughs> true. This is true. If there's no further discussion. I would just like to add, so there were a lot of emails that were sent and communications that went out over this process. And um, it's been a pleasure to hear from the community in such a robust way that the emails were thoughtful but respectful. Uh, at no point did it become, uh, at least from where I sit, um, hostile. And I, I'm just uh, grateful for the community to be able to come out in this way uh, and support their children, their students, uh, and uh, and I, I I've learned a lot through this. But at the same time, I also just want to uh, reiterate that um, this this um, I, I stand with the the homeschool parents and with the decision to align with Frontier. So. Yes, I would just like to say. I um, actually thank Darius for bringing this forward um, with the intent that you did. It's, it's, um, we heard it at Frontier the other night, his perspective on the, on the equity and fairness for all students. 
um, and defining who is in our school community, that kind of thing, which made a lot of sense. And, you know, we, I thought about some things that I hadn't thought of from my perspective. You know, I don't want to exclude any child. Um, but you brought up some excellent points that I, I hadn't thought of. Um, so I, I applaud you for bringing it forth. You saw some, you know, maybe unfairness, inequities for all the students, things that ought to be reviewed and just talked about. And I think that certainly has happened. We had a great conversation with some of the, some of the same folks the other night. So I think it's been a good thing as well. Mm, I agree with Mary. I think there are uh, things that, the decisions that could be made, things that could be changed. Um, and this, this is a good conversation to be having. Where, so is there, a, um, I don't know what our, what our vote is going to be. If we like vote on this policy or if we table it as a result of, my understanding is Frontier is taking it back to their policy subcommittee. Is that right? They voted yes. no. The, oh, okay. And it will be in future. Gotcha. Okay. So it's possible we will sort of be revisiting this in a different capacity once that other policy comes out. So do we make a motion and vote on it or do we withdraw it? Um, you can go do it either way. So it's not a new policy or amending policy. So by, if you table it, um, you would refer to the old policy. If you vote it down, it goes to the old policy. Right. I recommend voting it down. It's a little cleaner than having something on a table that's sitting up there. Mm. You're, you're kind of saying that you want it to go back and be revised based on- By the voting it down. So I, would, yeah. I think it's a little, a little cleaner in my, my opinion, although we were just at Sunderland and they chose the only opposite what they did. For what reason? Jessica said that I'll never put it on the agenda, so don't worry about it. You know, it was kind of that. So it was like, okay, have one or the other, but it is technically tabled and can be untabled at any time. So I think it's it's just cleaner to say, you know what, it's we we don't like the way it currently is, and um, but we disagree. And if the subcommittee, so your member, you your, we write policies as a five school district, so um, your membership will be on the policy subcommittee. Because when we reviewed all the policies, when which this one came up, we were, it was part of the policy subcommittee. So whoever I forget who's on, I just can't remember. So we will have a meeting, you know, to review policy, and this will be on the agenda. And ideas, we'll therefore, I, we'll take it up or not. Yeah. You know, what I mean, the, the policy subcommittee could say no, it's it's, it's working fine, or or it, you, know, you have to have um, procedures that are different than policy. Right? So mm -hmm. you know, what does the that kind of thing. Do you feel, Darius, that there's a need to keep this discussion open to uh, to hash out some of the points that Mary talked about in terms of the, um, you know what some of the thinking that brought the changes in the first place in terms of Coach I think what I, I think what ended up Frontier ended up saying is that exactly that that there are that they disagreed with the. With the, well, with the, there were a lot of different opinions that came up with it, but um, and in the end, they, dis they disagreed with the language, the new language that was proposed. But they did say that there is there is an issue of um, that things could be done to, to solve some of those um, concerns of inequity amongst public school students versus homeschool students. So, and then perhaps they could either put language into the policy or create something to go with. So I think is in Mary's that yeah. sound about right? So um, I don't want to make a motion to approve it because I don't approve it. Can mm -hmm. I make a motion to not approve it? That's what I that's what I said. Did I say that but, wrong? No, but I thought you said I would either vote I would it make, down. Someone has to make, make a motion, a motion to and then we'll it. vote it down. Make a yeah. motion to vote it down. But I don't want to use the word approve in my motion. <laughs> can, you, can you move to can I move to, 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 uh, to not, not to vote no? Okay. Well, I guess you're right. right. Make a motion to discard. No, that's all right. I'll, I'll do it. See what happens. <laughs> See what happens. Your colleagues are shocking. I move to approve policy IHBG. Oh, it's less a second. Oh, Mary, I got you. Second. I'm already on the second train. Okay. So, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for your. We're really wait, wait. <laughs> Can we do that? This is hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Just I think he's 
So now we just vote it down. Yeah. Just vote it down. Well, 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 we get the idea. Can we, we state idea. it for clarification purposes, though? Um, uh, so I will ask for votes of all in favor of the motion. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Oh, just what Mary's <coughs> motion was. So because oh. there's a lot of crosstalk. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yep. She made it a motion to yeah. approve yeah. policy yeah. IHBJ. I second it, so we can bring it to a vote. Mary, you're right. You just removed it from the table. You shouldn't make a motion. Mary's like, I don't want that. <laughs> no. you, you should just remove it from the table. That's how Robert's rules would work. You, you wouldn't take action on it. And it would die. Yeah. So, because okay. I don't believe you can move a motion and then vote against it. Why not? Mm -hmm. For some reason, my gut says you don't want to do that. Okay. I don't have a memory. Okay, so motion. Look it up. Do I have to make a motion to remove it? Yeah. Or can we just. A motion to table? Is that tabling now? <laughs> Which we're trying to avoid. You can actually just take no action, and it dies that way too. Oh, so no one makes no action. No one made no. It just okay. like there was an amendment that didn't go. It just say if no one if no one brings it forward, it, it dies. Well, I think but there's like a symbolic. If we, if I think there's a symbolic to voting, but I, I think you would have to retract your motion. There's a motion on the table right Gone. now. No, okay. Go. Okay. Oh boy. This is so oh, wait. <laughs> motion. No, you don't have to approve a motion to move in Robert Rules of Order. So the, sorry, I, I screwed up the whole thing. It, it, it says no, you do not have to approve a motion to move it in Robert's Rules of Order. Right. Right. So you can you can shoot it down. But it's been well, we retracted. I, I, I think we could. If I will call for a motion, and then we'll make the motion. All right. Okay. okay. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve policy IHBG? No. <laughs> okay. No. no motion. All right. So it's off of our table. Okay. All right. Moving on. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right. New business. Capital planning update. Alrighty, so I shared with you today the PDF version of that um, of what's on the board here, so that you can kind of look through. But no, we're not sending. We are here. For so it's kind of, again an ongoing list of all the things for those. Who, this is the first time seeing it. We kind of show everything in gray, what we've completed for the past three years. And you can read through the notes and how things were funded and what things cost. So you can get an idea of the amount of um, improvements we've done in the school um, in the past, basically since we started this document in my first year of superintendent, so the past seven years. Um, blue is the things that are still in progress. Um, in progress may also mean that we didn't pay the bill yet, um, which would be in the case where the entry project. Um, we haven't paid the bill yet. And the side engine project we're waiting on um, the addition of a handicap um, accessible ramp to be um, added on. So, um, and then the playground engineering, I don't think we haven't paid the bill yet. So basically, um, the last few years we've had um, we use some school choice money, we've used some ARBA money, we've used some grant money, um, and we use some ESSER money to take care of a lot of different things around the building. So we've done a lot the last few years. Um, looking ahead, um, we started calling ones in 1B, meaning that the 1B is like if we can get funding elsewhere, we're not going to look to go to the town as part of the capital this year, but 1B is like it's on our radar and we might find another way to pay for it. Um, and, um, you know, we, I'll go to 1Bs first, the replacement of the convention steamer, convection steamer rather. You guys remember Shelly was at the last meeting and she talked about how our lunch proceeds are a little bit high and, and our collection's a little high that we have to spend some of that down. So we may be able to pay for that steamer. We gotta buy lunch things with those, ones, those funds. Um, we may be able to buy a new um, convection steamer with those funds. So it's on our capital list, but it's not something that we're gonna go look at funding for. Um, hallway painting um, could be done in phases. You know, we're talking about, you know, doing, you've seen so in the front entryway, how wonderful that's kind of, um, Tina wants to continue that throughout the building. You can jump in if I miss a picture. Um, but we also could do that in phases 
with some of your money. So the whole thing would cost about 25. That's a round number that we threw at it based on you know, the other kind of the other painting we've done. But that can be broken up into parts, do a wing at a time for five thousand or seven thousand dollars. Just to jump in, it's not just murals; it's just repainting. Right. But I was thinking how nice it like. Yeah, no, yeah, Catherine or our teacher does some of the murals. So All right, so you're saying she didn't sign up to do the whole building. She did not sign okay. up for that. <laughs> Sorry, Catherine. I don't think I got the skill, but I can try. We're going to ask her, but she didn't sign up. All right. Um, so the uh, things that are ones, um, there are two that are um, very clearly we can, um, we can probably go after um, from the town. The first one being, um, so our. So we have boilers that we've been replaced recently. The boilers also have pumps that pump the water from the boiler throughout the building. Um, the, both of them are at 30 years old and the parts for them are obsolete. And the idea is to replace one each year for the next two years so that we get those up to speed so that if one goes down and they always go down when it's freezing out, it's probably because there's probably a greater strain on them. Um, we're doing the same thing up at Conway as well. Actually, they did an emergency order because one of theirs broke. They couldn't get parts. This is why it's on our radar here. And the second one started leaking. And so we did actually an emergency order to the select board up there to get the, to get a new um, circular pump. Because they're all at the same age. It's the only thing nice about our building being the same age. We've got one of the same problems at the same time. Um, so we're looking to do that. The second thing um, is to continue our flooring. Um, and said she had a knock, she left. <laughs> um, is this? I'm gonna see if I can get the maps. Oh, of course I don't have access to your maps. To the maps? So basically going back to, um, I was trying to show the flooring map, but it's not going to The, uh, I know, because oh, I'm in this. Is it on the PDF? Are yeah. You What's that? Are you on the PDF? Because I'm on the PDF. No, no I was on the live one. I wouldn't open it up. So anyways, the, we basically are doing um, six, like three classrooms a year. We've been making our way through the building. Um, A1, 2, and 6 would be the next one on the map. I'm trying. For some reason, I didn't have it. So that would be the other one that we bring forward. The big thing that's left over is that parking lot across the street is in is getting worse and worse every year. Um, mm -hmm. It's the same problem. Front. It's probably the same kind of disrepair as Frontiers is. Um, the good news is there are less structural issues than what Frontier has. Um, but it's the town's parking lot. So it really, the question is whether or not we should probably have a conversation with the select board, whether or not the select board wants to go through for funding for that, or does the school go through funding to try funding to pay for the school parking lot. And the reason why it's slightly different is for the most part, yeah, but how, can you share it with me? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. That's <laughs> so not right. Um, it's late. <laughs> thank you. The, uh, Thanks for being kind. So the question is whether or not we should just ask the town to put it on their list and they, they fund it and come up at that time. Because basically the way the t it has worked, the school is taking care of everything, the school, the town plows it, the town pot takes care of the potholes. We don't even have to request it. They've been very good about staying on top of it for the most part. Um, and so the question, but it is under our kind of purview. So that's kind of in our conversation tonight as well. Um, so. And then as soon as I get the thing, I'll show you the map mm -hmm. so you get an idea with the floor, where we are on the floor. Questions on what I shared? Yeah. I just wanted to share something about the parking lot and sidewalk. Mm -hmm. I myself have almost broken a bone getting through that parking lot, just kind of like twisting ankles. I'm a little clumsy, so I realize <laughs> that might not be. But I have seen other small children like really wipe out pretty like bloody wipeouts. Um, Walking to school couples. because it is a little treacherous, and then like the sidewalk area, it is even more treacherous. There's like huge divots, and um, 
there's like a lip between where the sidewalk is and then to the grass. So like, and there's tons of traffic, you know, crowded mm -hmm. kind of going to and from. So it's, it's agreed. Um, yeah. Does the 296,000 cover just repaving the existing parking lot and sidewalks in the exact same layout? Would that involve any changes? Same, thing. same layout. That is actually exactly that. It's not changing anything. It's um, the quote was made by basically having coming in, look at the amount of asphalt that's needed and the general cost of ripping up and putting down. Mm -hmm. So that's an envelope number. We'd have to obviously put it out to bid, you know, depending on the price of asphalt and contractors that year, that number would go up or down. Yeah. But so that would be our starting number. Usually it's conservative. So we'd probably be able to get a pricing less than that. Mm -hmm. um, just because we're bouncing around so well together here. The gray area is the area that's been completed. Um, and then um, yellow is installed is what we're proposing. No, which was yellow installed. Yellow happened this year. It happened this year, mm -hmm. purple the following year. So you can see we're, we're getting pretty close. Mm -hmm. We're getting pretty close to finishing the building. So I guess, the, but well, within the conversation, we do need to kind of talk about, do you want me to reach out to the select board and talk to them about the parking lot and directly say, do we want to put this on the town capital list instead of the school capital list? Because it's a major expense. And we're, and, we're going to, and we're going to talk about the playground in a minute, which is another major expense, which we're going to go to town for too. And that's been the problem with parking lots, both at Frontier and here, where I'll be honest, it's not my priority. Sorry, you tripped and fell. Wow, the whole <laughs> playground. Like, if we get a different like, playground out of it. Like, it's kind of like, you know, it's like, well, I, I got guess. It, yeah, it's like, new playground or parking lot? I'm going to pick the playground. Tennis courts in the parking lot? I'm going to pick the tennis courts. You know what I mean? Like, so, you know, it, it, unfortunately, that's how I, that's why Frontiers has gotten really bad because it's just, it's a, Frontiers is like a million dollar job. Like, it's going to freeze everything else. I know it's necessary and eventually we have to get to it, but that's why I was kind of going after program things first because, you know, kids programming comes first in my mind. Mm. So, but eventually parking lots aren't sexy, but they gotta get eventually get done. And same thing with roofs. Roofs aren't yeah. sexy aren't sexy either and they have to get done. Unless you're a roofer then you think roofs are amazing. But yeah. what is your sense of are there different funding sources available if it goes to the elementary? So the question is whether or not they can use chapter 90 money for a parking lot. I don't know what the rules are on that, but that they get different funding from the state. And that's why it would be good because if we do it through the town, I think we strongly recommending that you tell me to go to ask, talk to the select board about this because the town also could do it themselves, right? And so and with that, mm -hmm. they can do it. If the, if the highway department does it, um, they can do it for far cheaper. They can put it in for another job. They can put it into their bidding at the beginning of the season where they, they basically you put a bid how much road you're going to do and somebody mm -hmm. bids the amount of road so they can get a lower price on asphalt they could maybe somehow put it in there so there's other things that they can do that we can't do mm -hmm. we would have to go out to a you know a contractor that kind of stuff and um and i don't know what's in their queue for town projects in the sense of um and they only can do so much as you saw with the sidewalks they contracted out for part of it they did part of it so um do you need a motion, Darius? No, just conversations. Fine. As much as I'd like to get a print for a redesign over there and think about traffic flow, with everything else on the docket, it seems like that does have to go to the bottom of the of the list. And and so I would, you know, recommend that we look at the, see if the town could, you know, help cover the cost or handle the project. The amount of use that parking lot gets from nothing to do with the elementary school is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, That's really true. true. So yeah. I mean, it was completely full in town meeting alone. So yeah. in oh, really? sports, football, I mean, it's yep. anytime that gate is open, the parking lot is open. Well, during town game. meeting, there was the boys' soccer game. Yeah. Yes, yes. That was a, no, that was a big one. Really it, was, it was funny. I love town meeting. I walked out there and there were 700 people there. Yes. It was a, it was a, they were playing but two number one. But it's regularly full on the weekends. Yeah. When You're right. Are going Absolutely. On. Okay. Darius, who funded the, when the, re, when the walkway was re, we finished six years ago. They used um, ARPA money. They used their COVID money because, and they were able to justify that 
because they had to have their meeting outside. Mm. And so they used, they paved the whole, thank you, the town of Deerfield, they paved the whole walkway from the back of Frontier to the stadium, so to speak, was paved using that money because they need to be able to get, um, you know, you know, folks with mobility issues to the, because they had it the first one on the football field and they were like, well, we're not walking out there all the way. So the second time they had it right on the, right behind the building. Um, but they, they justified that money there. So it's kind of a win-win. <coughs> Okay, yeah. thank you. Because I, I want to get moving on that to put it on their list. Okay. While it may not happen this year, you want to get it on this year if you want to have the following year. Thank you for taking up the town. Yeah. Okay. Anything else we need to cover here? No. Okay. Playground renovation. So, um, we, so our, I think we took a, this group took a tour of the playground last fall, last mm -hmm. fall, last spring. Were you in, were you part of that? Were you, were you part of the fall? Oh, it was fall. Yeah. Yeah. Was it last fall? fall? Yeah. All right. So, so I'm gonna right now. What's happening is that so we went and um, used I believe school choice money to pay for um, Berkshire Design to come up with new schemes to make our playgrounds more handicap accessible. In the pre-K in the K-4 playground, and that's the playground when you face the building on the left-hand side. Um, the structure in the K-4 playground, the, the big one, is still in great shape. It's only nine years old. Um, but the ground is washed out. Uh, they didn't put in proper drainage when they put, when they did it originally. The pour and play is covered with um, wood chips. And the design of it has wood chips on both sides of a pour and play with kids running back and forth. So even if you go out and blow it and sweep it, the falling recess, again, anybody who's in a wheelchair, that kind of thing, it's, it's impossible to get through. The washout has created, if you haven't walked out there, you uh, be careful, but the, um, the pour and play surface has sunken in. Um, we probably can do some repairs to bring that up, like cut holes in it to put sand in. We have to do something like that in a different playground, but um, overall, um, and there's a lack of ADA accessible, accessible um, devices on that playground. So with that in mind, we contacted Berkshire Design and had them give us some layouts. So I'm going to share those on the screen here. We have a subcommittee that's working on this, uh, made up of teachers and um, Annie. Um, where to go? Oh, there it is. Um, really hard to see on this, but let me try to orchestrate this for you. This is the, has everybody been on the playground? Well, you, you can say that really confidently. But this is the, um, if you walked out this doorway and walked straight out the door, it will take you out here. And you would walk straight out, and this is the soft, the baseball fielders, softball fields way out there, the big ditch, wetland storm basin is through here. Um, the basketball courts are over here, and this is the big play structure right here, all right? So the idea is to put in, um, pour and play the whole thing. Right now, um, using uh, wood chips and such is, every year we have to spend thousands of dollars to bring this up in. You're supposed to have one foot of wood chips under fallable structures, keeping that there after it's been knocked away by swings, kids doing that kind of stuff, it's a constant, it's a constant mess. Um, so is to do pour and play through the whole thing, add a um, handicap accessible, wheelchair acceptable, accessible um, play structure. This is a, adding a new climber structure and remove uh, the individual one that's out there, the little pod that's nice. The kids kind of like it, but it's one that's like single use. And then moving the current kind of diamond climbing structure over. So that is the current, so what we did is we divided this project into two parts, the K to, K to four playground, which is this one, which we think is uh, first in line, and then the pre-K. So just talking about the K to four one. And then, um, uh, da, 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 da. Sorry. Sure. 
This is the other side of that map. Um, the pro just so you know what I, why I struggle over here is that you present it, but it's, I can't touch it, I'm sorry. Anyway, this is the edge of that, the big play structure. These are the basketball courts. Repaving those, if you ever walk on those now, it's covered with small stones that get dragged in from the side. Um, and when, you know, kids obviously are falling and that kind of stuff and you can't dribble a basketball without having stones stuck to it. Um, so um, repaving this and then we have an adult, I'll show you some numbers in a minute, but this is the current swing set. Again, keeping the structure, but putting um, board in play. This is all within the wetland area. The entire playground is in the wetland area, so we're gonna have to go to conservation um, to get um, allowance to do work within the wetland area. The wetland area actually comes right up this line here, almost up to the side of the building, within a foot or two of the side of the building. So um, it's okay to do things within the wetland area, especially if you're doing improvements. So, um, and you're not changing, we're not changing our footprint. So it shouldn't be a problem, but there is a series of steps that we're gonna have to go through with the town and then also with the state because um, anytime you're doing that kind of thing in the wetland area, they may have um, a state agency look at our prints as well. Okay. Questions on what we're putting together. So right now, the I asked, they even looked to see if there was a question. They kept on talking. Excuse me. <laughs> um, we have a subcommittee that's looking at this, and um, right now getting feedback if there's any changes, and we have a meeting next week. So... It could be slight changes, but I want to give you an update where it's at. And the reason why is that we want to look at CPA money um, for recreation um, to pay for the majority of this project. And the question is, and we're working on, like, can we get donations? Um, what is the realistic of that? The school budget, um, we're going to be a little bit tighter school budget this year. And we are got to be more and more careful with school choice. So we don't want to throw it just at that as the answer. This playground is the only playground in town for that age group. And um, when the other playground fell apart that they were gonna put together next to Frontier, um, I think it's time we can, I think it's a fair to say that we can go back to the CPA, not back, but um, we can go with, again, another playground idea um, to fund it. It's used all weekend long. Um, anytime you drive by on the weekend on a nice day, there's cars parked out and people are using that. Um, in the other, hang on, I'm gonna go back to back to the other layout. The other part is, so we have this broken up into sections, so whether or not we break it up into sections is one of the decisions we have to make. But the other part is the elementary, the, uh, pre the, elementary, the preschool playground. Um, again, if you haven't been to it, so, you know, you walk up the walkway, it's the first playground. There's like, a, there's like a shed right here, sandbox right there. But basically, the majority of those play structures are well out of date. Excuse me, the main play structure is falling apart. Um, you know, we had to rebolt it if the area is starting to rust. You know, it, it's, it's, it's starting to fail, especially for that um, age group. So the idea is to put in a lot of new pieces, except the swing set is still in good shape, um, and um, put in all, again, poor play surfaces right there. Right now, any preschool with mobility issues doesn't really have a playground. They can access the area over here, off this walkway, through here. It's, it, it's a dirt ground, not great. Um, staff members will try to get them two different objects, but they can't do, do so unassisted. So the, this plan here would have, you know, being able to roll, be able to roll out here, uh, ramp down into the playground area and have access to all all um, pieces. So, um, again, those pieces are being reviewed and such by the, our subcommittee. Um, and so we'll have an idea. Let me share the, um, the, the hard part, right? Because 
being cheap. So I'm going to go here. So we basically had it broken up into three parts. Um, the first one that you're seeing there is um, the pre-K playground. And as you can see, for some reason everything's really slow. In the you're looking at a $300,000 cost. Um, we've already, our, sub, our, uh, our group is already, our subcommittee's already talked to started to reach out and the town might be able to help us with removal so we're, we have to meet these numbers will come down but you can see where the costs are in the preschool to play equipment at one hundred eighty thousand dollars, and that's a that's a number that's going to be tough to move um, we can remove some of the play structures and then you have the rubber playing surface at eighty thousand um, dollars those are the big costs of the thing everything else you know bidding and, and you know for removal and that kind of thing can go can move around um, but you're looking at those other two numbers. Um, even though the rubberized surface, we did Conway at 16 per square foot. If you've been to Conway's playground, take a drive up there with your kids, if you got little ones, um, because that's kind of the idea that we're trying to replicate down here. Um, they were able to get it for 16. The number has gone up to 20. He seems they can come back down. So there may be thousands of savings there, but um, as you see, it's a very big price tag. The, you call it the one to six playground, but it's the one to four playground. Again, you're looking at a number that is at 360, 386 with a much higher number for rubber size service because of this, the amount of it. And the new play equipment. So that play equipment is extremely expensive. It, I made a joke and it's probably not funny, but I could park my truck out there and have the kids play on it for less um, with the music going, you know, the, the uh, the structure, the ADA structure, the play equipment is $85,000. Um, the second structure is the difference um, of that in the, whether or not we keep that structure in there is one of the discussions the subcommittees have to make because you, you start with what you want and then you have to reduce to um, what you can afford. And then the third area we, we, we broke out would be whether or not the swings and basketball court would be an all add-on. Um, again, the rubberized surface is, you know, a lot cheaper. Obviously, just under that particular swing set with 1,400 square feet um, at 28,000, you know. And um, again, asphalt painting at 10,000. If we had the town involved with this, that number, this particular one could come way down because they could actually asphalt that very easily. Do the uh, basketball court and the walk around to it. So. So the whole total, the whole cost of the project um, on the high end is just under $900,000. Um, realistically, given where the CPA just, um, you know, just made a big movement to, you, to do the 1888 building and is also using money, to, or they use the money to purchase, I don't know if they're putting more money into the senior um, area as well. Um, the idea is to write up our proposal and then have a conversation with CPA about how do we go about requesting that money? You know, how do we, because I asked them, do they want it well in advance so they can plan multi-year in a row and they're not set up that way. So I want to be able to request the entire amount and then go in and have a conversation that says, we can break this into parts, we can cut this down, like where, what's the appetite of which they, where they want to go. Um, but. That's where we're at. Exciting, right? Daunting. Can you talk about the benefits of doing it all at once versus splitting it up? Yeah, so if you do it all at once, you're probably gonna get a much lower bid um, because someone who's gonna come in and set up for asphalt sets up once. Whoever's coming in for the pour and play is gonna set up once. Um, for contractors, that's a big part of it, is that a lot of their, a lot of their fee is, um, their labor is the setup and breakdown of whatever machinery they bring in. So, <coughs> um, however, if we get the town to do the demolition, 
um, you know, that might, there may not be as much saving for the setup and breakdown if the town does mm -hmm. the demolition and the asphalt. Because I, I also think they could do the asphalt with the basketball court, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think the saving might be, is definitely worth it versus, you know, we're juggling. Getting different groups to coordinate to get the job done will be more difficult, but um, I think realistically to get through a price tag that's that high, that makes more sense. Are you looking for any guidance from us right now, or is it just no? It's an update. So the reason, the only thing that is also um, untimely is that that you know that it's we're going this route, um, in that I am going to be making a request to the CPA or they go by CPC, CPIC. Each town calls CP, CPA money differently in the committee that oversees it. Um, but I'm going to be making a request from the sub after our subcommittee meeting to the town that's due November 1st. So I'm going to be doing it on behalf of the school committee that we're going to be putting some kind of package together. Um, and I want to do it in a way that says this is the full project. We can break it into parts. We want to have a conversation about it. I think that's a, I think it's a, a fair way to do to approach it. Then, if we go in if we go in with a million, they don't have the money. I think they're only at nine hundred thousand right now. It's going to, they're going to get another five hundred thousand next year. They get about that much a year. So it will we? They'll have more than enough by the time the project needs to be funded. But um, I don't know. There's a lot of projects out there right now, and then they would have to go to town meeting as well. Um, so doing it in parts might be more attractive that way, but if you do one part and then you lose um, momentum, mm -hmm. it's, that's the size there, or moment, or support mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. town, they do not one but two, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, so I guess it's kind of an FYI that ideally you would have another school committee where you would vote to approve what we're putting forward so i'll send you a copy of every way to you so you are aware of what's going on but there's no um and then we'll talk about the november meeting there we there were some side conversations about private fundraising um what has has the district and, and tina thank you tina shared some previous private support that des has received has the district, do we have any data that would be helpful for that planning for a fundraising campaign that, that we could use to, because the challenge that we have is since we don't have a lot in terms of like a spreadsheet of these are the folks who support us or have in the past, being able to determine what could be fundraised, and I know that would be helpful for your, your, your case with, you know, in the community, um, I just, I, I, I hesitate to say a certain number could be fundraised without having any backup data. Um, no, we don't have a database or a good way of tracking what's been donated by whomever. And, you know, that's the one thing I've always, you know, I've worked in private schools as well. They do that very well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, I think you know, Deerfield Academy has more people on alumni relations and donations than I have administrators in our district. You know, I mean, so they got, they, you know, they, there's a, if you have a lot of resources for that, you can develop those plans. Um, and um, other people are going to people, other people all the time for money, right? And so if Frontier's doing something, you know, they're going to your, you know, the Polish Club has been very generous to things, you know, the, you know, other kind of, um, you know, institutions in town. And I had a short conversation with a um, select board member regarding, um, you know, should we go after Deerfield Academy or the other private institutions in town about maybe donating a portion of this there. But it really should be planned out because it's a big, it should be discussions with the town because they're having conversations with sewer and they're having conversations with everything. There really should be a planned ask and, um, when I look at Deerfield Academy, they should be giving a continual donation to the elementary school because the amount of students we serve. And so those kind of conversations really should be more coordinated than, sure, you know, we'll give you $50,000. Where'd that number, you know, that we'll take it, right? And then fundraising, I question whether or not the school playground needs to have $50,000 of parent fundraising 
mm-hmm. when we pay CPA taxes. Mm-hmm. Is, is my kind of, you know, so we've done two playgrounds um, in our district already. Um, Conway did it and, and Sunderland did one. So Con- Sunderland did a, a pre-K playground. That's the one that right in front of the building, if you ever pull in there. Um, they did pour and play, and, you know, some different efforts. It took them about seven years to get the project done. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, took donations for everything, and it was a labor of love. And Ben Barshevsky, who lives in town here, hats off to him as principal. He did all that year after year, getting different people to sign on, and eventually they were able to get, I think they used CPA money um, to pay for it. Conway had the idea, and then they had a, uh, Someone in town made a donation to town for the betterment of people with disabilities. And they were able to get a big chunk of that and I believe mm-hmm. some CPA money and they paid for it all at once and he just got it done. Um, it was, I mean, it's a lot cleaner and a lot easier, obviously. Um, so I, I, I know we're supposed to talk about fundraising because we're um, gonna, um, talking about that, but I, 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 worry, I don't wanna do bake sales for a playground. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like bake sales should be for, you know, smaller events and smaller kind of up things and or go to the pizzeria in town and ask for money you know what i mean like i think this is a lot of money um and whatever we do the cpa is going to want to see what are we providing on our end um as part of their application um i don't know i, I, I think i'm taking feedback on it that's a, yeah that's no a, you know i i, I <coughs> we don't want to be uh, knocking door to door collecting dollar dollars for this project you know, a, a structured capital campaign of sorts is what you really are looking for. It's just a matter of what scale yeah. and what we could pull off. Um, the dollars are definitely there. It's just a matter of, you know, identifying uh, who has the, who who would lo- like to support this project. It, it, it's a good project. Right. Um, and and so it's, wor- it's worthwhile thinking about, but it's a big effort at the same time to, yeah. um, Put the the case together and then to schedule the meetings to with those donors so. right right so right. It, would, it would likely be a separate committee that would we would need yeah. to form to oversee it and then we would need ambassadors obviously in the community as well right and so oh, i was just gonna say something that um we spoke about at length at the subcommittee meeting with some of the teachers and which was very helpful and there's an occupational therapist also on the subcommittee but you know it would bolster our case to the cpa and if we have to stand up at town meeting to sort of really advocate for this if we have shown that we've attempted to raise dollars from potentially some of the private schools or some of the if there's some bigger businesses in town who might get a tax write-off i don't know how all that works you maybe know um, it would definitely bolster our case a little bit more given all of the projects that are happening in town that we've covered that and it's not just like we're funding the whole thing, you know? Yeah, and I, and, you know, I also, there's got to be some, I haven't found it yet, but there's got to be some ADA money out there as well. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the fact that we're doing all this really um, to meet those students' needs. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the, the uh, a lot of the grants have dried up, so I, I don't know, I keep, keep looking. And maybe sometimes you look for a grant that's not through DESE for ADA accessible kind of thing. You look through somewhere else. Like foundations. Or yeah, like a, that, that's yeah. my that's my my problem is that I I go through DESE for everything. You know what I mean? That's the area I know. I don't know the area outside of that. So, anyways, watching. If you do know, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, sometimes the vendors for like the playground equipment can recommend grant grantors that they have seen or worked with. That's good, that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. You see that a lot with steel case. Steel case, um, when you use their classroom furniture, if you call one of their reps, they can connect you with some, some leads for grants. Right, right. That's a great idea. There's nothing else on the playground. Uh, our next topic is to uh, appoint a, the MASC delegate. Um, so the uh, MASC conference in November uh, contains the um, delegate assembly, at which point delegates uh, vote on proposed um, resolutions um, with other members from uh, around the state 
Uh, so we, as a committee, have to appoint a delegate. I am planning on attending the committee. No, I'm sorry, the conference. Will is planning on attending. I don't know if anyone else is going. Okay. Thank you. Um, so it's Friday afternoon. I am planning on being there. I've touched on it before, and I do not mind doing it again, unless you really wanted the opportunity to be the delegate. Can it be a joint effort? No. There's okay. one, one delegate from each committee. Well, I will be there to support you if you were <laughs> there, and I will, I will learn from, from your experience. Okay. Uh, and you, uh, anyone can, you can come and sit in the back yep. and watch if you wanted to. Great. Okay, so I will appoint myself as the delegate. <coughs> uh, and your packet includes uh, text of the resolutions. Uh, as your delegate, I am voting on behalf of the committee. So if anyone has any feedback, this is your opportunity to share it. Uh, the we way sponsor that... one. I just want to know yes, that yes. we are, our, yep. our school is a sponsor along with Frontier Regional on um, yeah, rural school. Yeah, number six. six. I'm trying to find it. We okay, we voted this for in the joint meeting, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the so the way uh, the delegate assembly works, it, it's a lot like town meeting. Uh, whoever is sponsoring each resolution gets up, uh, reads their what they propose, speaks their case for it, and then anyone who wants to have to speak in, about it, uh, for or against it, or have questions, they get up and talk, and then everyone, one member from each committee, votes. So it, uh, it's very informative. There's a, the conversation can be very helpful. Um, to be honest, going into it, there have been times where I read the resolution and thought, I have no idea what this means. I don't know. I wouldn't know how to vote. But after hearing the conversation about it, um, I do feel like I have an opinion you can vote. All right. If there's no discussion there, we can move on. Uh, the MCAS presentation. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a great time of night for an MCAS presentation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right Showtime. <laughs> We're all warmed up. <laughs> We're having technical difficulties. Um, I'll right. start in without my visual aids. Well, you know oh. what? You know what we'll do is we'll run it straight off of this. And since you're presenting, your face is going to really be beyond it. So yeah. for some reason, it just stopped working. Um. So we do an annual MCAS report, and it's really interesting to prepare for. I like talking about it, but I like to preface it by saying that we use so many different kinds of data to inform our teaching and our direction. And um, Gina's uh, principal report talked about the data meetings that happened at Deerfield, and she named about, I don't know, 10 other data sources that are important when we're looking at individuals, groups, grades, and whole school um, direction. Um, so please keep that in mind that this is just a presentation on one data point and I always like to say that data does a better job of raising questions than answering questions. Um, the MCAS actually should be seen in my mind as a living document. It tells a lot more over time than it does in one year snapshots um, because we have I think 170 something students who took the test um, and those students change if we really want to learn about how we need to um, continue certain things to grow strengths or change things. Uh, we have to um, look at it over time. So the headlines from the state came from the interim commissioner. The interim commissioner uh, ha held a meeting and, and these were the headlines and I, they don't um, necessarily parallel Deerfield, but um, it helps to know the context. So statewide, um, MCAS scores from last spring show a plateau or, or a decline in all major, major categories since the pandemic. This um, seems to come as a surprise. Things were looking like they were rising a little bit and then they have dropped off again. Um, I'll come back to some of the commissioner's um, narrative about that in a little while. The correlation between income and achievement is concerning statewide and that is true in our district as well. Um, student absenteeism remains a challenge across the board for recovery efforts. That's from the <coughs> interim commissioner. That's not something that I'm bringing to about tonight, but I wanted you to know what the headlines were. Um, so the overview at Deerfield is that 179 students participated, which is 99%, um, which is great um, in terms of our ability to um, rev review um, 
as many, the more people we have in our sample size, the more accurate it is. If we have students electing not to take it for all the good reasons that people would, might like to not take it, it could skew our feedback over time. So I'm glad that we have high participation. Those are third, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Um, Deerfield hovers around state average. Our accountability reading is moderate progress towards goals or towards targets, and those targets are set through MCAS. It's not related to our school um, improvement plans, but we are up from last year according to MCAS, so 46% accountability up from 29% last year. Um, so here are three snapshots showing how Deerfield and the state are um, compare. So for ELA, 37% of Deerfield students are meeting and exceeding um, versus 39 for the state. The way to look at these bar graphs is that blue is exceeding expectations and those are percentiles and green is meeting expectations and the cutoff is um, a score of 500. So um, students in green and blue, 37% uh, uh, scored 500 or higher um, on the, on the Usually. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little late. Um, in math, the green and blue for Deerfield is 49% meeting and exceeding expectations versus 41 statewide. And in science, the overview, and this is just fifth grade, so it's a small sample size compared to the state, but 55% meeting and exceeding versus 45%. And over time, our fifth grade has exceeded, um, has surpassed state averages around science. So um, part of what I get to demonstrate is how Open Architects, the tool that Deanna mentioned earlier, um, which we prioritized, I, I think it had been in conversation for a long time, but then the equity audit really said to disaggregate the data and get a better sense of how well you were serving all students since different subgroups, you really do need to have this kind of an engine. And, um, so some of my slides will show you what I was able to learn fairly quickly. The scores only came out on September 24th. Um, while the Deerfield ELA scores are slightly lower than the state average overall, if you disaggregate reading, language, essays, and writing, um, uh, in every grade level, DES is uh, above state average in reading and language. So it's writing that is our relative weakness. Um, in reading and language, 70% of fifth graders met and exceeded expectations. Um, and in the categories of essays and writing, um, girls performed higher than the state average. And I don't mean girls at Deerfield compared to girls in the state. I mean above the co-ed average. Um, and overall, 30 per, well, the boys performed lower than the state average in those two subcategories. And then looking at the overall um, ELA scores, 30% of boys were meeting and exceeding expectations versus 45% of girls. So this deeper dive helps us look at a gender um, gap in terms of achievement, and it also looks at domains of ELA and helps us focus on particular things. Um, reading and language scores have been higher than writing scores across the state um, since the pandemic. So that is also helpful to think about that it's, um, when we try to figure out what's the feedback, is it local, is it more generalized? A closer look at math um, and subcategories of math, um, there doesn't appear to be one particular area of strength over others. Some of the subcategories in math are um, geometry, measurement and data, numbers and base 10, algebraic thinking and operations, ratios and probability. Um, but grade to grade, different subcategories were the higher achieving or the, or the um, relative weakness. Um, and then we see that in math, 49% of girls are meeting and exceeding expectations versus 48% of boys, which is close enough not to be a significant disparity. Um, we will be watching the next three years worth of data um, on, because we have a new math curriculum that is being introduced this year um, for pre-K through five. We're using bridges and in sixth grade illustrative math. Um, it will take time for us to see um, the impact probably three years, I would say, until we are implementing it the way it is intended. As we learn the program and um, in the first year, the pace will not be um, as it will be three years from now when we're more fluent with the program and able to um, match our students because we know exactly what the resources offer and we can make more agile decisions. So I would expect us to have a plateau 
this year, um, but I would expect it to go up um, over three years. Okay. Um, uh, I was able to look at the growth of students with and without disabilities in our district as measured on MCAS. There's lots of ways to grow, of course, but the student growth percentile measures um, how much did students improve their score compared to students who scored similarly to them last year um, and also had disabilities in schools with similar settings. So a rural school with about 200 students taking the test. Um, so at Deerfield, 47 students out of 179 participating in MCAS were students um, with disabilities. And in ELA, the student growth percentile was 54, not 54 students, so that is awkwardly written, but the growth percentile was 54 and um, for students with disabilities and 56 for non-disabled students. And so that is uh, um, good news that it's that close, that our students are achieving differently, but they are growing at a similar rate that we are serving both groups of students with equal growth measurement. Um, and then in math, um, the student growth percentile for students with disabilities is 47 and 52 for non-disabled students. And again, that's relatively close, not as close as I would like, but still a 10 point spread is where it starts to seem significant <coughs> given how small our numbers are and how our student groups change over time. Is disability defined as IEP and 504 or? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. So this is another type of graph that the um, Open Architect platform makes possible. So here are two pictures of how achievement is correlated with income in ELA and math. So um, this is ELA and that's math. And um, so um, this is achievement. So over time, you can see that the um, income disparity after the pandemic. Ah, sorry, Darius. Just press another one. This one? Okay, so um, the achievement was much closer before the pandemic, and then in ELA, the achievement dropped more precipitously for low-income students, and then has been following a similar trend, but not closing the gap since. Mm -hmm. And the 50th percentile of income. Pardon me? So, the, the lines are showing 15th and 45th percentile of income. Oh, uh, um, these are low-income scores. And these are non-low income scores in ELA oh. and the years are 2021, 22, 23, and 24. What's the 15th and 40th percentile? Oh, this year, um, students oh, were in the 15th, okay. low income students were in the 15th percentile in ELA and non-low income were in the 45th. Okay. So there's a 30% difference there. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. It's huge. Um, and in math, it's the 27th percentile achievement for students with low income and um, 58th percentile for students without low income in math. So um, here we have um, precipitous drops for both groups, but more of a precipitous drop for low income and then not the recovery we would wanna see, not the closing of the gap. Um, it's still lighter now than it was pre-pandemic. Um, it's a very helpful graph. Yeah, I think that this tool is very helpful. Okay, and then this is another type of graph, um, and it made more sense to look at the correlation of race and achievement um, with this type of graph, um, partly because there are um, multiple categories, it's not two lines, but every dot represents a student, and we don't always have enough students who are non-white to become statistically significant, but we can see patterns when we look at this type of plot. So while the um, average scaled score is not, is not dramatically different, the fact that there are high achieving students who are white and not so many dots up here um, is something that I think we should pay attention to over time. And of course, these are individuals and there's not that many individuals. Um, so you don't wanna make generalizations about kids in particular, but if this were true, for a long time. I mean, there's not that many dots up in this range either, but I would want to look at it over time. This is ELA and this is math, so we have just a big white space here um, that I would want to look at. 
So some takeaways that I want to offer is that, um, well, the big picture, there's a slight dip in ELA scores, a slight rise in math scores and high scores in science, that within ELA, reading scores um, are significantly higher than writing scores, <coughs> that um, we have a significant achievement gap correlated with income levels, and we have similar growth among students with and without disabilities. So um, some of the next steps we can take would be focus on closing achievement gaps among student subgroups. Um, that has been a focus and will continue to be a focus for our district, but I mean, uh, I have some ideas about that. And then focus on improved writing outcomes. Um, so some of my, some very, uh, what do you call it, half-baked thoughts because this is in conversation right now. Um, could we be looking at a different model for summer support? One of the things that the commissioner said in his address was that um, because of the um, plateau and decline, he expected to see robust summer programs being offered to help close the gap, um, to offer to students who um, would regress if they didn't have um, the consistency of school instruct and academic instruction. But we have been offering um, robust programs in the summer um, for the last three years, and there's been a lot of attrition from people, from students being interested in signing up or families being interested in signing up. My interpretation is that after the pandemic, there was some anxiety about being behind and that families were excited to put their kids in school for summer and kids were excited to see each other in summer if you're in school settings. But that's kind of tapered off and everybody's exhausted because um, school is harder, the world is harder than it was before the pandemic and vacation is very much needed and playtime is very much needed. So we invited um, probably four times as many students to summer school programs than chose to attend. And we couldn't pull people in, the students in who we wanted to be, you know, um, um, supporting. Also, uh, it's really hard to ask teachers to come in in the summer now and teach. It's, um, it, it's school life, it's very important to take breaks and we're not seeing the same eagerness to teach summer school from highly qualified teachers that we used to. So. Um, staffing it is also more difficult. So I think that if we want to target some support for students who are at risk, or um, I think we should think about tutoring models or um, vacation camps or pairing robotics and writing, something that has more draw to it. Um, and I don't know that offering three week or four week summer camps is the best model. This would be something that would be discussed by lots of different teams of people. So I'm just saying my idea, but this isn't something that anybody has agreed with me on or has weighed in on yet. Um, it just felt like really work, a lot of work and a lot of money went into the summer school programs and for not that much of a turnout. But again, we could look at more data. We could look at um, some of the fall scores that we have and compare them to the spring scores for kids who went to summer school and see if it did make a difference. I haven't done that yet. So we might find out that it does make a difference. Another thing is that um, I think that we should do a review of keyboarding and figure out where that fits into our school system and into our vision for students. And I don't know where that conversation will go. Um, this is the year that our school reviews the um, digital literacy and computer science program. So in a recent meeting with all of the library um, and media center teachers, we had um, the state expert, Melissa Zeitz, come and talk with us about what she would recommend we focus on in, a, in terms of an instructional vision in that domain. And she did bring up keyboarding in second grade as something that she advocates for. Um, you don't need to have little hands on big keyboards. Some of the programs um, support hunting and pecking, but just gaining the fluency because kids are using digital tools anyway, so promoting some good habits and some mm -hmm. um, knowledge about how to use the tool correctly is important and it seems like when you look at the students writing scores um, this would take more of a data dive but um, more and more <coughs> students are being recommended to use speech to text or to use keyboarding at early ages to accommodate executive function difficulties or dysgraphia and um, of course there are incredible benefits in handwriting i'm not advocating for not doing handwriting i'm just saying that i think it's the next question because the students have to type their essays in third grade on MCAS and um, you get points for how long it is. So being able to sustain writing is yeah. part of it. MCAS would never drive our instructional decision, but it might point out to us that there's a level of frustration or not a level of fluency. So we would look at it. 
but they wouldn't let MCAS drive our curriculum. It would just say, well, what's going on here? Why is writing so much lower? And why is it lower for boys? And what are, we, what are the other correlations with that population? Mm -hmm. Um, but we would want to do a full research and have a lot of teacher input into that kind of a thing. Um, we have new curriculum in ELA and math. Um, it, it will be, last year was the first year for ELA, um, and this is the first year for the new math program, and actually there's even a part of the ELA curriculum that we staggered, so in some skills this is the, this is the first year for ELA. Part of the reason both programs were chosen was for their um, rigor and for their ability to um, reach all students equally, um, to have culturally responsive, not just content, but the way that students are engaged in the classes, the way that teachers are encouraged to teach would be ideally um, meeting all students um, and not privileging uh, the learning style of a majority population or of a dominant learning style, that it would be more um, diverse, more universal design for learning. So we'll see how that works. And then I think that this data tool is really exciting and the, the data meetings at every level, um, grade levels and um, admin levels and um, instructional leadership teams um, to keep learning more about what we have just started to peel back thanks to this tool. So. Questions? Yeah, at the beginning you mentioned uh, that scores had plateau or dips. Is that at the elementary level or so you say that again? At the scores that have statewide plateaued or dipped, is that elementary level or high school as well? State level, yeah, that was a state comment, not ours. Yeah. Yeah, that was um, statewide all levels, yeah. Okay, I was thinking the kids who were, I was wondering if it affected the elementary schools more, the kids who took the ELAs last year were young elementary school kids yeah. when the pandemic hit, and I would imagine that they would struggle more to catch up rather than kids who had a few years of schooling under their belt or were older. So it even happened in the high school levels. Yeah. Mm. It's eighth grade and tenth grade. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I really uh, appreciate the breaking it out by student groups and being able to present information. It's helpful because it's good ideas. Room for focus, areas of focus. Okay, okay. Uh, next up we're talking about the uh, donation. The, the uh, Men's Sunday Basketball Group. Yes, yeah. you too. You get the talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we've received a donation from the Men's Sunday Basketball Group. Um, Bill Hayes said that he collects um, a few bucks every game from the men that play, and he invested it, and he ended up with ten thousand dollars. <laughs> so <laughs> he donated it to school and. Um, he would like for us to kind of earmark it to support student recreational activities such as field trips or um, PE related activities and materials. Oh, or, or, no. playground. or playground. Or playground. <laughs> I mean, that makes your classroom. Well, yeah. Or wow. Student recreation. Yeah, wow, that is a very generous donation. Yeah. That is a wonderful story. Right. Super generous. Is, what's the background of this the men's basketball? Is it, do they play in? Uh, they, they use our um, gym on Sundays. Yeah. And I guess he's been doing it for years before I came aboard. Um, and he said, well, I met with him and he said, um, we were gonna donate it but um, a couple of years ago, but then COVID hit and I've just been investing it. Yeah, Great. thank you for doing that. <laughs> yeah, Amazing. it was a surprise phone call. So that was a little um, nice little gift. Yeah, nice phone call. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so, do we have to uh, accept the donation formally? Yeah, this work? I believe yep. so. Okay. So, would anyone like to make a motion to accept the gift of ten thousand dollars from the Men's Sunday Basketball Group? I'll make a motion to accept the ten thousand dollar donation from the Men's Sunday Basketball Group <laughs> to support activities such as field trips or PE-related activities and materials. All right. Thank you. Second by Danny. All right. All in favor of accepting the donation? That's an easy one. <laughs> Motion passes by well. All right. Thank you for that update, Tina. Yeah. <laughs> Great news. <laughs> All right, reports. Uh, I have no report tonight. Collaborative. Um, so I forwarded everyone the executive summary from the collaborative. Um, I also attached what I thought was an interesting um, 
piece that they, the collaborative put together is this all of the services the collaborative covered offers and how our district, I mean all the districts in Franklin and Hampshire are utilizing the services and just kind of interesting to see what, what they might offer and how mm -hmm. we can use them. So um, if you have any questions or are looking for more information, I have lots of other summaries from the collaborative I could forward you if you're interested. <laughs> There are all the information there. Right. Thank you. Superintendent report. I don't have a report. I just have an update that um, there's always, throughout the last seven years, there's been whether or not the word vote is written after anything on our agenda. <laughs> it means you have to vote on it. If it's not written there, do you have to, can you vote on that? Um, we got clarification from MASC that anything on your agenda, um, one can expect you to take action on. So you don't actually have to write that, but we found another posting where they said, we put votes maybe taken on the head of each section just to avoid any confusion. So just letting you know what the legal side is, if it's on your agenda, you can take action on it because that's the assumption. Um, but we also added, as you can see on your new agenda this time, votes may be taken for anything on each area. So um, we're gonna add that because people, we're transitioning from having always rate, you know, vote taken um, the only thing that would be different is if it's the first read, we've added it's the first read, no vote, or something like that. Sounds reasonable. Yep. All right. Thanks, Darius. Okay. There is nothing further. Is that anyone else discuss? I would be looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. All in favor? Okay. Call the meeting. Close meeting at 8.57.